thanks everybody for attending. I know we'll be adding people as we get going here. Uh, this is our second webinar with Dr. Antoine. The first one was a big success. We had uh, a pretty large attendance and good outreach and lots of good feedback on YouTube and through our social media channels. But Dr. Antoine uh, is up at the Pro Ortho in Kirkland and um, he just does a fantastic job both communicating with patients as well as just having good outcomes. And the thing that we were kind of excited about last time was we we're calling, talking about Achilles tendinopathy and patellar tendinopathies in his kind of some of the new treatments that he's kind of kind of working into is that this would be kind of talking a little bit more about the common injuries seen with shoulder pain in our weightlifting athletes, overhead athletes that are in the gym, that are returning to the gym here as we hopefully get to phase three here at some point and people start doing a little more heavy lifting. Um, you know, he's been an orthopedic surgeon for a long time and has done work at Kaiser and has done uh, his fellowship with uh, one of the orthopedic surgeons for the Oakland Raiders, the and then Oakland Raiders, now Las Vegas Raiders. And, um, you know, just, just an all around great guy. So I'll let you take the floor. We'll have some time for questions. You can also, uh, in the Q&A tab on your Zoom, you can send those to me. I'll relay those to Dr. Antoine. And we should have a few moments to kind of ask questions. I know there's gonna be a lot of PTs in attendance, so that's, that's great. And uh, we appreciate the access and the uh, information. So I'll let you take it from here. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Ben, for the intro. And thanks, everyone, for taking some time out uh, during lunch break here to, to join us. And so just want to go through some of the common causes, uh, somewhat bread and butter stuff that we see in weightlifting and weight training athletes, um, certainly in my practice. Well, I'm trying to advance our slide here. Okay. Um, so just first of all, disclosures, no conflict of interest or any financial disclosures for me related to this talk. So we'll just go through a quick overview here, hopefully take about 15 minutes going through some of the common causes uh, that we see of uh, shoulder issues or problems in weightlifters and then open it up for some uh, question and answer. So first for uh, folks on here, I know we have a mixture of PTs as well as um, uh, some non-medical personnel. So we'll just review some of the basics of shoulder anatomy. We'll discuss some risk factors that we uh, see or encounter for some of the problems that we're going to talk about. Uh, then we'll look at three very common sources of pain in the shoulder in this uh, patient population. And we'll go through briefly some of the diagnosis and treatment of those common problems. And then finally, as I said, we'll open things up for a question and answer um, at the end. So just going through some of the basics of shoulder anatomy um, for the therapists that are Watching this will be uh, fairly basic in review, but just for those of us who aren't uh, medical, uh, the shoulder is made up of three bones. The humerus bone, which is our arm bone, as well as the scapula, which is the shoulder blade, and then finally the clavicle or the collarbone. Um, these come together in two joints, what we think of as the main shoulder joint being the ball and socket joint you see here. Uh, we call the glenohumeral joint, the glenoid being the socket and the humerus here consisting of the ball. And then above there, we actually have a joint where our collarbone meets our shoulder blade. And that's known as the acromioclavicular joint with this portion of the shoulder blade being known as the acromion. So looking at some of the unique factors about our shoulder joint, the shoulder socket is actually relatively flat, say compared to a hip joint, which has a lot of bony constraint and a deep socket. So that has the great benefit of allowing this excellent range of motion that we have of our shoulder, but the cost of that is instability. So the shoulder is inherently somewhat of an unstable joint where it's much easier for the ball to come out of the socket. And the shoulder depends on soft tissue more than bone to keep the ball lined up in the, in the socket. And we'll talk about a couple of those restraints, which are the rotator cuff and the labrum. So when we look at weight training in particular, of course, weight training and resistance training put a lot of demand on the shoulder, as you can see with this maneuver here, uh, with an inherently unstable joint that puts a lot of uh, stress on these soft tissue restraints. Um, shoulder pain and problems are fairly common in this population, and problems might occur, or some of the risk factors that we look at are improper technique, uh, but also lifting too heavy or too much weight, and then finally lifting too often without enough time for recovery. 
So looking at three common problems that, uh, that we see, uh, looking at uh, anatomy groups, we first will talk about rotator cuff problems. And in particular, we can have issues with tendonitis or what's known as impingement, as well as rotator cuff tears. Uh, then we have uh, a chromioclavicular or AC joint uh, related problems and pain there due to arthritis or a problem called osteolysis. And then finally looking at labrum tears. So starting off with the rotator cuff, again, just to go through some of the basics of the anatomy there, the rotator cuff is a group of four muscles that originate on our shoulder blade, and those muscles come out through their tendons to wrap around the ball and socket joint, uh, forming uh, uh, stabilizers there, but also helping with movement. So the four muscles that are involved, just to go through, again, naming those structures, we have the muscle on the top called the supraspinatus, then we have the infraspinatus coming on the back here and the teres minor. And then finally, if we go over to a front view, we have a big broad muscle on the front that comes and attaches at the front of the ball called the subscapularis. And contraction of those muscles, again, is gonna help with rotation and elevating our shoulder, but also to help stabilize the ball in the socket. So what problems do we see in the weightlifting population here? Uh, namely, we see very uh, commonly shoulder impingement or tendonitis and then less common, uh, but uh, certainly present are rotator cuff tears. So if we talk about rotator cuff uh, impingement or shoulder impingement, uh, this is a very common uh, problem that we see in the general population, but more so in this population. And the reason is that with overhead movement, the space available for our rotator cuff underneath the roof of our shoulder blade decreases. And this can lead to some rubbing of the structures that live there, the rotator cuff tendon, but also this sac of fluid called the bursa. And that can lead to bursitis or tendonitis from inflammation of those structures. As the problem progresses and becomes more severe, we can even get on to seeing rotator cuff tears. So what does it feel like? So patients who have this problem will complain of pain in the front of the shoulder or the side of the shoulder. This is typically going to be worse with overhead type of activities and lifting. As the condition progresses, so you can get to the point where it's even painful at rest and without lifting uh, and even with sleeping on the side. So for diagnosis, when folks come into the office with this, we can generally sort this out with a history of what causes the problem and where the pain is and a physical examination with certain provocative tests. Uh, we'll always obtain some plain x-rays just to rule out other conditions such as arthritis. Uh, usually on the early stages when folks come in, we don't need to get an MRI or advanced imaging uh, if the physical exam is normal and the strength is normal. So the treatment of this, again, in the early initial stages would be uh, some common sense things that we would think of like rest from any activities that might cause the trouble, ice and anti-inflammatory. Uh, the mainstay of treatment that is curative in most cases is physical therapy for a structured uh, rehab program. Uh, if that fails to help, typically after six or eight weeks, uh, then I'll recommend injection into the shoulder, in particular injection into the bursa sac that lives beneath that bony roof causing the impingement there called the acromion. Uh, traditionally, this has been with steroid. More recently, there are other options that we're looking at, um, such as uh, PRP, uh, but I won't get into the details uh, of that too much because it's beyond, beyond the scope of our talk today. And then finally, for folks who will fail those, which is probably only about 5 or 10% of the time uh, to get better, there are surgical treatments that can be done to treat the shoulder impingement and inflammation. So when we look at surgical treatment, this is typically reserved for failure to get better after three, even up to six months of non-surgical management. And again, the goal of that treatment is to treat the bony impingement as some folks will have some calcification or essentially a bone spur that may decrease the amount of space available for the rotator cuff causing pinching. Uh, so either arthroscopically or through an open incision, uh, but typically arthroscopically, this can be burred down and removed to create more space. And the recovery afterwards involves physical therapy, and it will typically take about three to four months to fully recover back to high level lifting or, or strenuous activities. Looking at further along the spectrum, as I mentioned, we can get into the situation where there are rotator cuff tears. And so what a rotator cuff tear is, is detachment of the tendon from the attachment on the bone. We can either have complete tears or full thickness tears, which is shown in the diagram here, 
or we can have more mild conditions where it's a partial thickness tear where a part of the thickness of the tendon has detached but not completely. It can involve either one tendon out of the four or sometimes we can see massive tears involving two or three of the tendons. Uh, this can be caused in a couple different uh, fashions or ways in the weightlifting athlete. Typically this is going to be a repetitive gradual wear and tear phenomenon but certainly with uh, certain accidents or, or different lifts, we can see a traumatic tear uh, where this can happen with one single event. Uh, the symptoms of this are very similar to shoulder impingement as far as location of the pain and things that are, are bothersome. And important to understand is sometimes we'll see weakness with this, but one can actually have a fairly large tear of the rotator cuff and still have normal strength on examination. So the initial evaluation and uh, workup and diagnosis as well as treatment is very similar to shoulder impingement, uh, which is rest and anti-inflammatories and ice and physical therapy. Uh, if there's no improvement after that appropriate uh, course, then we'll go on to some advanced imaging, usually an MRI or ultrasound to look at the rotator cuff. So this is showing an MRI of the rotator cuff where we're looking at the rotator cuff muscle over here and it's coming across and turning into a tendon which is black and that tendon should come down and attach to the bone here, but we can see that the tendon does not make it all the way. So white fluid, which is filling this bursa area, is filling the gap there and showing a full thickness tear. So treatment of rotator cuff tears can be non-operative or operative. Generally for a, a smaller tear or a partial thickness tear uh, that's come on with wear and tear, we'll start off with some non-surgical management, including physical therapy. If there's failure to improve after this, then we'll transition to surgical repair uh, after approximately three months of trial of non-surgical treatment. The exception to that would be a traumatic tear where someone has a distinct injury and has a full thickness tear. Uh, we know that folks will do better with initial surgical repair early of that. Um, repair is typically carried out nowadays arthroscopically through small poke holes and using small tubes where we can place anchors and sutures and sew the rotator cuff down to the bone. Uh, it takes time for that tendon to heal so the recovery can be uh, fairly gradual but hopefully return to weightlifting activities and higher level activities by five or six months. Then moving on to AC joint related pain. Again, to review the anatomy, the AC joint is where the outside end or lateral edge of the clavicle meets the acromion. And this is a true joint in the fact that it has a cartilage surface there that can wear down just like our hips and our knees wear down. And it also has a articular cartilage disc within it. There's not a whole lot of movement that goes on across this joint in the normal setting, but there is some movement and some stress with overhead lifting. So there's two common problems we'll see in the weightlifting athlete here. We can see AC joint arthritis and then a special process called distal clavicle osteolysis. So starting off with arthritis, uh, similar to other joints, this is a gradual wear and tear process where the surface cartilage breaks down due to mechanical forces. Uh, it can be sped up by an initial trauma. That's the other situation where we may see this come on. And with that loss of cartilage, we get inflammation of the joint with pain and tenderness. As you have less cartilage on the surface, we'll start to get bone against bone contact, which will lead to bone's response to make bone spurs there as shown in the diagram. Distal clavicle osteolysis is known as weightlifter's shoulder. Um, so this is one where I'll definitely see in the younger athlete who maybe isn't old enough to be showing arthritic changes yet, but has very similar symptoms of tenderness and pain in the upper uh, aspect of the shoulder over the joint. And this is a process where the bone actually wears away due to that chronic inflammation and stress across the end of the, uh, the bone. Uh, typically, again, it's from repetitive lifting, although initially it was described as a traumatic uh, or post-traumatic event. So again, the symptoms are very similar between these two problems, typically pain in the upper shoulder and tenderness where we have a bony prominence where that joint exists. Pain is usually worse with, with activities where we reach across our body or what we call adduction. So this will come out in the weight lifter with bench press type of activities. And I'll typically find that things are worse with above shoulder or at shoulder level activities where something lower down such as cable crossovers below the shoulder may not hurt. 
So looking at treatment again, we have our, our uh, history and physical exam typically are gonna be the key to make this diagnosis and plain x-rays can confirm uh, the bony changes there. Uh, the treatment again, will start with rest and typical conservative measures. Uh, when we do have arthritic changes and in inflammation, often patients will benefit from an injection of steroid into the joint. And finally, for failure to improve with those conservative measures, uh, there are surgeries which can address this. So if we look at surgical management of AC joint pain for both arthritis and for osteolysis, we can treat this either arthroscopically or through an open surgery by excising or removing a little bit of the end of the collarbone, typically about a centimeter or slightly less. So in the arthritic patient, this can help by getting rid of the bone against bone compression and creating a space there once again that the body will fill in with some soft tissue. And in the setting of the osteolysis patient, we're removing the abnormal cystic bone and the inflammation in the capsule that are causing the pain. Uh, this can have a quicker recovery because there's not the need for tendon to bone healing. So often in two or three months, uh, we can have you back to uh, weightlifting and heavier activities. And finally, moving on to the labrum and looking at labrum tears. So the glenoid, again, is the name of the socket of the shoulder. And the glenoid labrum is a rim of tissue made up of a fibrous cartilage type of material that essentially deepens that socket and uh, creates a better fit between the ball and the socket, providing stability. <laughs> and so this has a chalk block type of effect, stopping the ball from rolling out of the socket. The superior or upper part of the labrum also serves as an anchor point or attachment of the long head of our biceps, uh, and that can uh, make it prone to traction type of injuries. So with weightlifting, typically we'll see these as a repetitive stress uh, type of event. Typically with heavy loading, such as bench press, the labrum will get loaded, particularly in the back, uh, with the stress of keeping the ball stable in the socket. Um, so this is more of our push-off type of mechanism where we'll see a tear towards the back with that type of lifting. Um, we can also have a pull-off or traction type of mechanism, as mentioned, which creates an upper labrum tear, or what we call a slap tear, which stands for superior labrum, anterior to posterior. And then less commonly, we can see traumatic uh, events where we can have a shoulder dislocation, and that would create a typical tear of the front part of the labrum at the lower aspect. So typically when patients present in my office, it's usually just a repetitive use uh, type of event, occasionally a trauma, uh, but essentially we'll complain of pain in the shoulder. And this can be a little less classic than rotator cuff pain, which is in the side of the arm or AC pain. It can be a little more vague, but typically will be described as a deeper type of pain, uh, either in the back or the front of the shoulder or sometimes both. Uh, and there also may be complaints of instability or a looseness feeling, uh, depending on the extent of the labrum tear. So looking again at the diagnosis, again, history and physical being important and plain x-rays to rule out other causes, x-rays will be normal in the setting of a labrum tear without arthritis, and then we'll move on to MRI. So this is an MRI here shown uh, looking at cross-sectional cuts through the shoulder and demonstrating a tear in the back part or the posterior labrum, where we can see that the bony socket here is able to have some fluid go between the labrum, which is this triangular uh, black structure, and the bony attachment, whereas you can see in the front or the anterior labrum, that's a smooth transition. And so looking at the treatment of labrum tears, again, depending on the extent of the tear, most of the time we can start with conservative measures, uh, resting from the activity or modifying our technique and trying to cool down the initial inflammation, and then physical therapy to work on strengthening the rotator cuff and other stabilizers in the shoulder in particular. If symptoms persist, then we'll usually then move on to surgery to repair the labrum uh, back to the socket. So again, looking at the indications for surgery, generally this is occurring in the setting of failure of non-operative care. Uh, the exception would be if it's clear that non-surgical management would fail based on uh, the size of the tear or unstable flaps that are getting caught in the joint. So looking at some of these intraoperative uh, pictures here, this is an arthroscopic photograph of a labrum that's torn at the top. So we can see our biceps tendon. So this would be considered a superior tear or a slap tear extending from the front part up here 
around the back part or posterior part of the uh, socket. And this is a shaver preparing the bone to heal. And the surgical repair is done passing sutures around there and securing it back to the bone to get this to heal. So for a tear that we see here, a repair would be done. For more minor flap type of tears, we'd look at cleanup or debridement surgery. In the setting of slap tears, some patients may do better depending on the condition of their biceps uh, with a, a release of that biceps and what we call a tenodesis rather than repairing it uh, back down. And typically this is again a five month recovery going through different uh, phases of rehab along the way before return to heavy lifting. So in summary, this is a very common issue that we see in, in weight training and uh, resistance training athletes with respect to shoulder pain uh, or instability. Uh, many uh, cases can be prevented with good attention to uh, proper technique with lifting uh, and also an appropriate training schedule and intensity as far as ramping up with adequate rest and recovery. Uh, frequent sources of pain that uh, we see include the rotator cuff with respect to inflammation or tearing of the rotator cuff, AC joint related pain such as arthritis or osteolysis, and also labrum tears. Uh, most problems can be treated effectively without surgery through physical therapy, uh, but surgery has a fairly good success rate in the cases where this uh, fails at returning people back to their baseline activities. All right, thanks awesome. everyone again for your attention, and now we'll open things up for any questions that came through to Ben. Yeah, we got a, a few questions already, so kind of piggybacks really well on what you're just finishing with, and that is from a PT intervention standpoint, what, what do you see from a patient standpoint when you get them back in the office that you're seeing consistently done by therapists to have the most success? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would depend on, uh, on the condition that we're, we're treating. I think really for any of the care even that I give or the therapist is, is you know, communication at the outset about what the goals are and them understanding the mechanics of the shoulder, uh, in particular the role of of strengthening of the rotator cuff, but also shoulder blade movement and periscapular um, mechanics, I think is, is uh, very important. So I'd say kind of attention to, I didn't kind of get into the scapula thoracic part of shoulder movement, but uh, understanding that as a big uh, part and focusing a lot on uh, deficiencies that are there for both people who have pain and patients who have instability. There's a, sec a second question kind of in that same vein. If you have a tendinosis or a tendinitis, much like we, des we described with the Achilles tendinopathies and tendinosis, is, is there a, where, a place in the rehab for eccentric work for um, subscap, supraspinatus? Has that been played around with much? Yeah, you know, certainly I, I know people haven't focused on that as much as say classic locations, um, you know, with the with tennis elbow or, or Achilles there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think certainly uh, that would be part of, you know, part of the regimen there uh, for, for the rotator cuff as well. Um, and then, you know, along other lines, looking at some procedures that can be done to treat that, as we kind of mentioned in the previous talk, um, you know, thinking of, it in, thinking of it now in the same way of some of those other conditions um, as far as the tendinosis part goes. Um, question about uh, two, two part. What, what are your thoughts on uh, ergonomics and then diet inflammatory foods? Yeah, so these are, are things that I discuss a lot uh, in practice and actually seeing a lot of folks with COVID actually in new offices at home. Um, again, history, right? History and physical does a lot of our job for us. So I, yeah, I, I, it's something I definitely address as far as uh, in an area like this where there's so many tech people and working at desks and keyboards, I think a lot of it is driven by postural imbalances. So I spend a lot of time talking about that with, with folks uh, as far as ergonomics and, uh, and how that can drive shoulder impingement in particular uh, with tightness of the anterior shoulder girdle muscles versus posterior uh, there. And then again, coming up with the second part of it with, with diet uh, and anti-inflammatory diets, that is something that I do discuss uh, more so with my arthritis patients, I'd say, than, than some of the tendinitis folks there um, you know, looking into some sources of anti-inflammatory diets and turmeric and different things. And a lot of times I learned a lot of this stuff from patients, you know, uh, that are, uh, that have naturopaths and different, uh, different folks there uh, as I've been in practice. Here's kind of a specific question about 
collagen patches. So if you have a massive rotator cuff tear, kind of as you described back earlier in the rotator cuff section, what are your thoughts on the collagen patches and like any maybe precautions you have with those? Or is that something you do frequently? Yeah, yeah. So with, you know, use of it in particular, you know, SCR, superior capsule uh, reconstructions. Um, yeah, so I would say my thoughts on it again are, you know, we're fairly early in the experience to see if that's going to be durable. Um, I haven't been a big augmenter of rotator cuff tears. Um, I've been fortunate that generally when I encounter massive, uh, massive cuff tears, they've been primarily repairable. Um, and I am able to get those fixed typically. Um, and then the idea of the uh, superior capsule reconstruction, um, again, I'd say early experience, um, you know, with, with those um, is is mixed so far, but as far as the rehab side of things with P, with PT, um, I'm pretty conservative with my cuff repair, uh, anyways, with the sling for six weeks and passive passive movement uh, there. So no difference in the in how I rehab, you know, whether I augment or not. I don't know if this is something you you do frequently, but for total shoulders, there's a question about total shoulders. Can they get back to full bench press activity? Yeah, so I would typically say no. And so yes, I do total shoulders. Um, and so one option I will use in this population who are kind of discussing um, is the weak link in the shoulder replacement is, uh, is the socket, is the artificial socket. Um, so there is the option of not, not resurfacing that with an artificial implant, uh, but doing what's called a ream and run, run type of procedure, uh, where the humeral side or the head side is, is resurfaced, but we just try to get a, a fibrocartilage response or reshape the socket there. Not as reliable with pain relief, but it doesn't have that same restriction. The bench press part of it, the, the part that would make me a little more nervous as well would be the fact that we have to take off the front rotator cuff tendon, the subscapularis. Um, so I think most patients who have that have a little bit of weakness after a shoulder replacement of the subscapularis even when it heals. And that would probably hinder, you know, full performance, um, you know, back to pre-shoulder arthritis yeah. level with bench press. Um, another question, in regards to acute and subacute rotator cuff injuries, what kind of mobility and self-care exercises do you prescribe for a highly active patient? Yeah, so I, I guess if we're talking in the non-surgical, and again, not not sure on exactly you know the acuity that we're talking about, but essentially, if someone has a recent injury of their shoulder, um, you know, I'm going to prescribe them with full motion program as tolerated right away. If very painful, we're starting just with pendulums and and uh, you know countertop passive exercises, but essentially passive initially, progressing to active assist and active without restriction to try and prevent post-injury or post-traumatic stiffness or development of a frozen shoulder, uh, I guess would be the best way I can answer that. And then as pain becomes minimal to absent, then we're focused on the uh, strengthening phase. Yeah, it's, it's interesting kind of like just the conservative nature that we've kind of seen these trends go back and forth. I know when Dr. Koo first came in in 2010, super conservative on the, on the protocols, much more so than what you're describing as conservative now. And so we had a lot yes. of a lot of freezing up and a lot of stiffness. And even though they had great outcomes long-term, yeah. the stiffness is like a big benchmark for the patient's, you know, kind of grading of the success of the surgery, yeah. even though at seven months they're fine, but it, it's very cumbersome and, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, but better than re-tearing it. <laughs> yes, so, I know. And, and we all kind of, yeah, you're, you're correct. That pendulum of, well, let's not move at all for six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get stiffness and, uh, and then if you have some re-tears, well, then you become more conservative. And uh, yeah, so I think we're all as surgeons influenced by our latest failure is kind of the same, right? Fine balance. And you always remember the failures more than the successes. So yes, you do. Yeah. Uh, one last question here. I think we've got time for one last one. And that maybe is, uh, they didn't really describe what type of tear in the rotator cuff, but maybe your favorite anchor type or you know, the type of anchor that you would like to use for say a moderate rotator cuff tear versus... Yeah, so typically, again, um, not to get too technical, or we can get more technical, by it, but I tend to be a, a double row repair person, so I'll usually use a knotless technique, and I use um, dissolvable anchors. So I'll usually put a medial row in of a corkscrew dissolvable anchor, uh, tie sutures there, and then link those to 
uh, lateral row of knotless anchors uh, there that are biocomposite or dissolvable anchors, uh, which allows a knot free, basically equivalent of the old um, transosseous suture technique that was from the open days of surgery. Right. Anything else you want to leave us with? That's we, a ton of questions. So thanks for everybody for sending stuff in. And we had some sent in even before the lecture started. So that was great. Um, I, I don't have anything else for you, but I really appreciate you coming and, and doing this again. I think it's a great service to therapists. I noticed like on our, on our list of attendees, it was primarily physical therapists. So, you know, they're obviously perceiving a lot of value of kind of having this time with you, although not in person, uh, yeah. still, still very valuable. Yeah. Um, so if anything you want to leave with us or any ways that people can reach you if they want to send patients to you or connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. No, just, you know, thanks again for setting this up and, and hosting and, and happy to help out. Um, you know, folks can, can reach me. The easiest way to, to uh, send patients to me is uh, going through our the Pro Ortho uh, website. And, um, you know, certainly from therapist to therapist, um, uh, honestly, Ben has my information and I'm always happy for, you know, direct uh, discussion with a therapist or, or anything like that to get in with me uh, that way through my email. So I'm happy to, you know, have it, have any therapist through Ben get my email and can directly email me and happy to discuss patients and have you just give them information and we can reach out that way. Or you can give the patient's information to uh, go to proortho.com and then they can request an appointment that way uh, or through my website, which is listed on there. There should be also be a portal uh, where they can uh, request an appointment through an email directly to my medical assistant. That's, that's perfect. All right. Well, hey, well, thanks so much again for doing this and taking time out of a busy Friday and uh, stay safe, everybody. Okay. All right. All right. Hey, thanks, thanks again. Take care.